It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life. From health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being, change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Narcissism is a term that gets thrown around quite a bit, but how much do we really know about it? Joining me today to talk about the complexities of this personality trait is Dr. W. Keith Campbell, author of the book, The New Science of Narcissism, Understanding One of the Greatest Psychological Challenges of Our Time and What You Can Do About It. Dr. Campbell uses the latest scientific research methods to dispel common myths and preconceptions, and he provides insight into one of the most interesting psychological challenges of our time. Welcome, Dr. Campbell. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So, Doctor, we often hear people being described as a narcissist. What is the definition of a narcissist? It's a great question because it means several different things. So when somebody says narcissist, um, often we're talking about, you know, some traits like selfishness or self-centeredness, maybe arrogance. or um, So we, we, we have something in mind, but, but there's different meanings to this term in uh, you know, in the in the psychology world, we talk about narcissism as a trait, meaning that we all kind of have some level of narcissism from people who are at the high end to low end. And that trait of narcissism is a combination of a sense of entitlement and feeling you're better than others, a sense of maybe superiority, but also charisma and extroversion and drive and charm and ambition. And so when you put those two things together, this combination of sort of entitlement and superiority, but also drive and ambition and charm, you get what we talk about as grandiose narcissism, which is this trait where often we see with, you know, politicians and our bosses and bad relationships. And we, we kind of see this, this more grandiose form of narcissism in a lot of places. And, and that's usually what people are talking about. But there's two other forms of narcissism that come up a lot. One is a more vulnerable form. And so these are folks that are think, of, think they're superior to others, think they deserve special treatment, but they're also a little shy. Sometimes we talk about it as covert or basement narcissism because you don't really see it as apparently. And, and they can be really insecure. So people who think they deserve special treatment but don't really get it, and they end up in therapy quite often because of the depression and anxiety that goes with that. And then finally, we have this this psychiatric or clinical term called narcissistic personality disorder or NPD. And so this is the personality disorder that goes with narcissism. And it's, it's a combination of a very high level of, of narcissism, but also to make it the disorder, it has to have some sort of impairment. It has to mess up your life. So if you're super narcissistic, you think you're awesome and it works for you and everyone agrees, it's not really a clinical disorder. But if you think you're awesome and it's ruining your marriage because you can't really love your family and it's ruining your work because you're, you know, being dishonest with your books or you're cheating people, uh, then it can be diagnosed as a disorder. So really, there's, there's sort of three ways we use narcissism in the psych, psychology world. And, and that's what makes it so complicated when it gets into the, you know, the everyday world. Doctor, you said that this is one of the greatest psychological challenges of our time. Has narcissism always been this prevalent, or is there something in society that's driving it today? Yeah, so, so narcissism is something that will emerge in societies when it's allowed to. And when it's allowed to is when you have a society that really focuses on individualism, so that everybody does what they want and don't really focus so much on the community. And it happens in a society where you can get away with a lot, where you can present an image of yourself that might not be true. So imagine you live in a small town and you know everybody and somebody says that he's a big deal. You go, look, I, I went to school with you. You're not a big deal. It doesn't work. 
But in a in a big urban center, if I move in there and start saying I'm a big deal and put on social media posts and, and build this brand, I can convince people I'm a big deal. Mm-hmm. So we have a world now where people who are narcissistic, we're self-promoting, we're self-enhancing can be very effective because you have to do it to survive. So right. I think we have a world that's really conducive to narcissism. It is. It's a world on social media where everyone's trying to outdo each other. It's, you know, see me, see me. I have something to say. And and I can see how that would lead to the problem. Oh, uh, yes, for sure. It's and, and, you know, I don't mean to say, like, we're all doing this. I'm, I'm on social media right now. I'm on media right now uh, talking to you. And, and I hope people listen. So it's not that there's anything wrong with wanting to get attention. There's nothing wrong with social media. But for people who really are focused on getting attention, who are really interested in showing off how awesome they are, how much they know, or how they're smarter than you, or they want to criticize people all the time, social media is really attractive to people like that. And in the research, we find people who are narcissistic just have more connections on social media in general, more friends, more followers, more likes. It, it just works. You had mentioned before that sometimes the person can't really love his or her family. Are they able to make strong emotional contact with another person? The reason I ask this, I believe that I was actually married to a narcissist. And the reason I believe that is I think he was looking for a caregiver, someone who took care of him. And and when I changed the dynamics in our relationship, I did that for 23 years. When I finally said, what about me? And I needed something in return. He took his love. And the first thing he said was, I no longer love you. And so his love was attached to me performing an action that he needed. So when someone doesn't do what the narcissist needs, are they truly able to love? That is a, I, I, I'm sorry uh, mm-hmm. for, for that experience. Um, but you're hitting on a really good point in that in our relationships, we're often interested in a couple different things to compete with each other. One is we really want love. And love is often about giving things, you know, giving love, helping people, being nurturing, and in turn being loved and being nurtured. And that's really important. And the other thing we want is somebody to, you know, maybe give us some status, pat us on the back, make us feel good, tell us we're, you know, good people, take care of us, and make us better. And that's a great thing, too. Uh, The challenge with narcissism is you get in a relationship and you're really focused on what you can get out of it, what you can extract from the other person. Do I, does my partner, is my partner attractive and does that make me look important or powerful or high in status? Does my partner tell me I'm awesome all the time to help me regulate my emotions so I always feel I'm good about myself? You know, does my partner defer her needs or his needs with work so that my work comes first? So what happens is you get all these conflicts where the narcissist in the relationship does well with me first. And as long as, as long as me first happens, that's a great relationship for the narcissist. But when me first goes away, like in your case, it's not that important. And what you're telling me is that your partner said, you know, I, I don't love you anymore. Now, that's shocking. And there's been a loving relationship because it just doesn't work like that. You can't right. really turn it on and off. Right. Um, but you can if your love is, is basically a currency that you're giving to get something because it's, it's not that important to you. And it's very hard to understand that somebody can have a really awesome car and that car could be more important to that person than a loving relationship. But that happens sometimes. And so then do these people have more difficulty feeling empathy or sympathy for another person? Oh, oh for sure. It's just not as much in their, in their language. So there is an idea, and it's still around, that people who are narcissistic and, and you know, when you get to the more extremes, you're talking about psychopathy. And, um, but when people are narcissistic, that they can't feel love, and they're incapable of doing that. It doesn't seem to be the case. It's, for most people, it, there, there's a capacity for love, but it's an underdeveloped capacity because for people who are narcissistic, love is sort of secondary to ego needs, affection, attention, status, being awesome, being praised. All those things are more important than love. So they've spent their life figuring out how to get praised and positive feedback and attention and fame and status, but they haven't worked on that love muscle, that, that capacity to connect with people because it's not as important. It's almost like they're uneven in, in how they're developed. 
And I would assume then a person who is an unconditional giver, who just gives of him or herself, that would be someone who would, you know, be ripe for the picking for a narcissist. So how can that person self-protect? That You are absolutely right. Um, I, I wrote the book called The New Science of Narcissism. And the problem with that is there's always newer science. And, and after I wrote it, there was this recent paper came out that looked at people attracted to narcissists. And it's consistent with what we've seen is that what we've seen in the past is that people who fall in love very quickly, who fall in love fully and quickly and give themselves uh, without reservation are more at risk because they're easier victims. They're not bad people. In fact, they're often lovely people. But the trick with getting in relationships with narcissists is you want to go slowly because if you go slowly, you'll see the problems. If you go too quickly, you're going to fall in love and it's going to be exciting and you're not going to see the problems until it's too late. So my advice is, you know, go slow. Go slow in relationships in general. It's going to keep you out of some trouble. And what would be some of the warning signs, the clear warning signs that we should be looking for? You know, it, with narcissism, there's this stuff that that's sort of apparent, you know, the materialism and the nice dress and the, you know, the, the self-presentation and, and different things like that. But often those qualities are very attractive. And so when we meet people who are narcissistic, I mean, when I meet people who are really narcissistic, I often just like them because they seem so charming and confident. Mm -hmm. And so when I really like somebody, I always make that a warning sign. <laughs> but but in, in reality, the thing to do is look at somebody's track record. So if you're starting a relationship with somebody, look at their past relationships, look at their history. People who are narcissistic and self-centered or ego involved will hurt people and they will do it throughout their lives. People don't change that much. And so if you see a trail of destruction, you stay away from somebody. If you see somebody had loving relationships, you're like, that's a person who's capable of having loving relationships. So focus on the past more than what's put in front of you because people who are narcissistic are charming. That's, I mean, that's part of the deal. But so it's going to convince you, you know, that they're better than they are. Can a narcissist make a strong leader? Can they ever use this trait to their advantage? Oh, all the time. Yeah. And that's one of those places narcissism really works is in the short term, I should say, is mm -hmm. that when we've done research on leadership, people who are narcissistic, the more grandiose narcissists, not the more insecure ones. Uh, but the more uh, secure narcissists rise into leadership very quickly. They want to be leaders. Uh, they look for opportunities to be leaders. So when we study leadership emergence, that's kind of the scientific term, emergent leadership, uh, narcissism predicts that. Where narcissism falls apart in leadership is over the long term, where with narcissistic leaders we find more you know, sloppy ethics, rule-breaking, um, you know, cheating, that kind of, you know, there's sort of darker behaviors that, mm -hmm. that go on with narcissistic leaders, but they're very good at becoming leaders and they can be good leaders, but they're often in very chaotic situations. It's a challenge to be in a personal relationship with this person. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the big, a big challenge with narcissism and maybe the big challenge with narcissism Either if you're very narcissistic, you're relating with people, is that relationship piece. It's that because relationships are always about giving something up that you want to get something bigger in the longer term. Marriage, you give something up to get something bigger. You know, friendship, you give something up to get something bigger. You join a team, you give something up to, to get something bigger. And that we make that sacrifice all the time in life. But for people who are narcissistic, that's more challenging. And so there's going to be lots of problems when they do it. So somebody, let's say, is married to a narcissist and they've been in this relationship 20, 30 years and, you know, they're finally seeing the other person for what he or she really is. What are their options? How can they manage this and mitigate the damage? You know, it's, it's a really good question you're asking and the challenging one because if you're if you're starting a relationship, you're in a, an abusive relationship. I mean, my advice is just avoid it. You know, which is the same advice you give your daughter and everyone gives. Just get out, especially if you're being hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but you've been in marriage 20 years and things you kind of have a way it works and it's stable and there's no real abuse. And people are going, you know, do I stick with this? Do I just go get free and try something else? 
I wouldn't be afraid to go try some sort of therapy or some sort of counseling or some sort of work uh, to try to make things better. And the reason why is because we're finding in the research more and more that personality can change. It's not easy to change, uh, but people can change. Uh, the biggest, or one of the biggest challenges with narcissism is that people don't want to change. It's, it's working out pretty well for them. And in the case of your husband, you know, it sounds like you got an ultimatum and, and it wasn't enough. So it's not necessarily going to work to give people a, a, a chance to change. But I think it's possible. And I think it's often worth a shot more than I would have if you'd asked me this 10 years ago. Well, and you know what I find, and just to, to stay along the lines of my story, he just replaced me. He just went and found somebody else. And so, you know, I, I think that what you're saying until a person really wants to change, I was going to ask you if there is a success rate with it, because I would think, like you said, it is working out pretty well for them on the surface anyway. I mean, it really isn't, but they think it is. Yeah, it is. It, it absolutely is on the surface because you know, if, if somebody's romantic interest has as much meaning to them as a car, it can be changed. And that's very hard for people to understand. You're like, I can't change my wife because she's my wife. There's no other person in the world that would fill that role. But if I thought my wife's role was really just to make me look good, I could find someone else to do that. No problem. So it's easy for them to change. Um, in terms of the numbers, it's very hard to get estimates because we don't have any great, you know, clinical trial studies on narcissism, unfortunately. But it seems, when I look across all the data, that if people are willing to commit to some sort of therapy, and it doesn't seem to matter which kind, if you can just find one to commit to, some sort of treatment or some sort of intervention, uh, there does seem to be possibility for change. But the challenge, again, with people who are narcissistic is getting to do it. Doctor, what do you believe is at the root of the problem? How can we try to keep our children from going down this path? Uh, you know, it's, it's a mix of genetics. It's a little bit of parenting, but not so much. It's, it's sort of it's culture people grow up in. Um, my, my simple advice for parents, so I'll try to keep this short, it, because this is a concern with everyone, including me, is first of all, be a good role model. You know, that, that should go without saying. And then the things I focus on is it's not so much keeping your kid humble because, you know, you don't necessarily want to do that. But I say CPR, focus on compassion or caring, you know, be compassionate and hope your children are compassionate, reward them for being caring and compassionate because that, that love or compassion is a really good buffer for narcissism. The second piece that I think people neglect and I think is super important is passion. Kids who do things they're passionate about, you know, it could be dance, could be sports, could be writing, could be, you know, I don't know, Minecraft, whatever the kids are into. If you're passionate about stuff, it doesn't necessarily make you narcissistic. It makes you love that thing and it makes you share it in, in a loving way. So you can be really engaged and really good at things and not be that ego involved because of passion. And the third piece, and this is the, you know, a little more parental, is, is focus on responsibility taking. It's just one thing we see with narcissism is this real strategic or slippery use of responsibility taking where people who are narcissistic will take responsibility for any good outcome they see and they'll blame anyone else when things go wrong. So if you can teach kids to take responsibility when things go right and also, and this is more important, take responsibility when things go wrong, that's going to be a buffer against narcissism. Are there any myths that maybe we didn't touch upon that you think are important for people to know? There's a few out there, and I think one that, that's been around a long time um, is that people who are narcissistic deep down are really insecure. And the reason people have this, this sort of myth is because there are these two kinds of narcissists, these more grandiose forms and these more vulnerable forms, and they, they want to think they're all the same, that they're all vulnerable deep down inside. And it just doesn't seem to be the case. People who are kind of confident and arrogant are often kind of confident and arrogant. And maybe they say they're a 10 and they really think they're an eight, but they're not deep down insecure individuals. They're not. And so, and, and sort of the corollary of that is people will say, if you just find something narcissistic and you really love them and they can get past that deep insecurity, they won't be narcissistic. And I've seen no evidence for that at all. And in fact, 
there's some evidence that if you're too giving to people who are narcissistic, they'll just take advantage of you even more. So that's the one myth I'm concerned about, the sort of the, the wounded child inside the narcissist. Not like the people who are narcissistic don't have trauma, they don't need help, but, but the idea that you can find that and heal that I think can be a little dangerous. The book is The New Science of Narcissism, Understanding One of the Greatest Psychological Challenges of Our Time and What You Can Do About It. If you'd like to get more information about Dr. Campbell and his work, you can visit keithcampbell.com. And as always, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read our digital magazine, and be sure to sign up for our mailing list. Doctor, in our final moments, what's the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? You know, I think just understanding that narcissism is, it can mean a few different things in different, in, in different contexts, that it can be a trait that we all have, or it can be a, a clinical disorder. But if you're throwing the term around and, and you're being indiscriminate, so you're saying your friend has a clinical disorder, it can be a, tr- it can be a little bit troubling. So just try to be thoughtful with terms and maybe focus on specific behaviors before labeling people. Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, thank you. That was great. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.